Hello, thank you guys for coming. So I'm going to talk about respiratory emergencies um, today. So I hope it's not too overwhelming for you, but I know that, you know, as a young doctor, as an intern, the respiratory cases were always very overwhelming. So hopefully this will help uh, make it easier when you have a pet come in that's in distress. Um, so this is just an outline of what we're going to talk about. We're going to go over very briefly review of normal lung function. Uh, well, then we'll talk about how to assess oxygenation and ventilation in our patients. Then we'll go into um, abnormal lung function, initial examinations of a respiratory distress patient, how to localize where the problem is, and then we'll do case examples, which I think are more fun anyway. So for the normal lung function, I mean, this is these are human lungs, obviously, but you get the basic gist, so you have the air that enters uh, through the nose and the mouth. It's warmed, humidified, and then it passes down the respiratory tree. Um, when that happens, larger particles, debris are filtered out, and then um, once you get down to the uh, distal trachea, it's going to branch off into successive generations of smaller and smaller airways until you eventually get um, to the alveolus. So the primary function of the lungs is gas exchange. Um, again, this is going to occur at the level of the alveolus. So here's a little picture of an alveolus here. So this is filled with air, oxygen. Gas exchange basically occurs via ventilation and perfusion. So you have the oxygen in the alveolus that's going to diffuse into the blood that kind of travels by all the little alveoli in the lung. And then the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood into the alveolus to be expired. Um, so this is basically just restating that, but the blood gets to the capillaries near the alveolus um, via the pulmonary vasculature, and that's what, we're, when we talk about VQ mismatch and things like that, the Q part is the perfusion, which is how the blood gets to the alveolus. So the blood leaves the heart, the right side of the heart, goes to the pulmonary arteries, branching occurs, and then it reaches the capillaries. Um, so again, the red blood cells go by the alveoli, the oxygen leaves, um, binds to hemoglobin in the blood, and then the carbon dioxide leaves hemoglobin and goes into the alveoli. So they basically just swap places. That process of the airflow is called ventilation or V. Again, we have diffusion. That's where the gas crosses the blood gas barrier. So the oxygen itself is going to diffuse down its concentration gradient. So the oxygen in the alveoli concentration is 100 millimeters of mercury, and in the venous blood, it's 40. So it's going to leave the alveoli, which is on this side of this picture, and go into the red blood cell. It does have to pass through a lot of layers here, water, surfactant, a bunch of epithelium. Um, and then there's the interstitial space here. So when you get to significant lung damage, um, this whole layer can be destroyed or filled with things, and that can be where a lot of um, pretty significant respiratory disease occurs, would be at the, these layers right here. So once the oxygen is in the blood, it's then transported to tissues in the body for use uh, via hemoglobin. So that requires a couple things. You have to have adequate ventilation. You have to have adequate gas exchange. You have to have enough hemoglobin, um, which is something that's important in our anemic pets. So if they don't have enough hemoglobin, they can't get oxygen to their tissues. And then you have to have normal perfusion. So if you have a low blood pressure, then you're not going to get enough oxygen to your tissues. This equation can be a bit overwhelming, but I do think it highlights uh, something important. So this would be looking at the oxygen content of blood. If you, multi or if you add together the percent of oxygen that's bound to the hemoglobin and the percent of oxygen that's just free in the plasma, um, that's kind of how much oxygen you have in your blood. So if you look at this side of the equation versus that side of the equation and do the math, obviously there's much more oxygen bound to hemoglobin than free in plasma, um, which is pretty important to remember again for the anemic pets. Another important equation would be oxygen delivery, which is how you get the oxygen to the tissues. So that is the oxygen content of blood multiplied by your cardiac output, which is just your heart rate times your stroke volume. How do we assess oxygenation and ventilation in our patients? Um, the gold standard, which is not done often unless perhaps you're under anesthesia, would be an arterial blood gas. Um, so here's just a, a chart of normal values for dogs and cats. Particularly what we're interested in would be the PaO2 and the PaCO2. 
For your PaO2, that's the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood, and that's going to tell you about your oxygenation status of your pet. You really don't see a lot of increases in PaO2 in a pet that's breathing room air. Um, if your pet is under anesthesia, that will sometimes be higher than 100, which can be confusing, but it really doesn't mean anything. The thing that's concerning would be if the PaO2 is low, and that indicates hypoxemia, so low oxygen in the bloodstream. If it's less than 60, uh, that's considered severe hypoxemia and they may need to be ventilated. For the PaCO2, that's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood and that's going to be an indicator of your ventilation status. So if that's high, that can indicate inadequate ventilation. So this is where um, the patient's not ventilating well enough, so um, they're retaining carbon dioxide. This would be patients that are kind of gasping for breath or only taking a breath every 20 seconds or so. So if that level gets above 60, then that's also an indication that maybe the pet needs to be intubated and ventilated for. Um, if you have a low PaCO2, that indicates hyperventilation, um, which can be seen commonly um, like in anesthetized patients, or if a pet is compensating for metabolic acidosis, which is uh, pretty common in like um, really sick DKA dogs or things like that. So pulse oximetry is probably one of the more common ways to assess oxygenation. So that is going to measure the percent of hemoglobin that's saturated with oxygen. And it is an indirect measure of the PaO2. Um, so it works by sensing the amount of light absorbed by the pulsating blood flow. And it reads two different wavelengths, um, red and infrared. And then that's kind of proportional to the amount of hemoglobin that's dissolved. It can be affected by pigmentation, so I know we've probably all tried to get a pulse ox on a pet with black gums. It's very difficult. Motion can also affect it. Um, if they have decreased peripheral perfusion, that can um, cause issues. And then if they have the uh, presence of non-functional hemoglobin, like methemoglobin, if they've gotten into carbon monoxide, uh, or things like that. This graph can be a bit overwhelming but it highlights an important point. So this is the oxygen dissociation curve and it shows the tendency of oxygen to bind hemoglobin. So on this side you have your percent uh, hemoglobin saturation, so this would be what you're reading on your pulse ox, and down here is what you would get from a blood gas, your PaO2. So the solid line, the solid line here is the oxygen dissociation curve. Um, so this is the percent oxygen combined with hemoglobin. So as you can see, it kind of flattens out up here at the top. So if you have a pulse ox reading above 90, uh, then your pulse ox will correlate pretty well to that. It'll be above 80 and your pet will be oxygenating normally. The main difference comes um, at like 92 and below. So if you take a line over here and you draw the line down, your PaO2 is suddenly down to almost 60. So that indicates, again, almost severe hypoxemia. So the, the main point is that small changes like below 95 in your pulse ox indicate a pretty significant change in your partial pressure of oxygen. So it's actually a lot worse than it seems. Some more equations for you because as criticalists we love these things. Um, but you can, and this is more common in humans, you can um, compare the PaO2 that you get off your blood gas to the fraction of oxygen uh, in the air, um, the FiO2 ratio. So at room temperature, that's 0.21 or 21% oxygen in room air. Um, so if you do the math with that and you get between 400 to 500, that's considered normal. If your ratio is less than 300, um, that would indicate acute lung injury, and if it's less than 200, then that would indicate acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use a pulse ox, which we get a lot more often, um, compared to the FiO2 ratio um, and do something similar in our patients? Well, some people thought it would be, so they did a study in 2013, and they did find a relationship, but they couldn't decide any values. So they are related. I'm sure they're probably working on studies to decide what those ratio cutoffs should be, but um, you can do that as well. The um, final equation that I'll talk about is the alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. That basically compares the amount of oxygen in your alveolus, the big A, to the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream, the little a. You can read the equation here, but basically um, if you take the partial pressure of the air, which is 760 at sea level, 
minus the partial pressure of water, 47, times the FiO2, and subtract it by the PaCO2 that you get from your blood gas over a respiratory quotient. Um, that is about 150, and then if you subtract your PaO2, um, then you would get a normal value between 5 and 7. If the value is higher than that, then that indicates some level of inefficient gas exchange. So where this can come in handy would be if you're not sure why your patient isn't breathing well and you have an arterial blood gas, um, there are certain causes of hypoxemia that can be ruled out with a normal AA gradient. Um, and if it's high, that can indicate kind of diffuse parenchymal disease. So destruction of those layers that we talked about earlier. Finally, to assess ventilation, capnography is going to be the easiest way to do that. That measures the end tidal or the expired carbon dioxide. Typically, this will be in patients under anesthesia, and that's going to be a reflection of your PaCO2. And so that can be helpful as well. And this is just a picture of a normal capnogram. So for your abnormal lung function, um, the f there are five main causes of hypoxemia. Um, hypoventilation would be one of the more common ones, um, and that's just from decreased airflow into the alveolus, and that results in hypercapnia, so your PaCO2 would be high there, and that's going to improve with oxygen. Uh, the second one there, VQ mismatch, that one is going to be one of the more common causes, and that is just, so if we think about ventilation as airflow like we talked about earlier, and perfusion is blood flow, um, if there's any sort of mismatch there, um, that indicates you know, inefficient transfer of oxygen carbon dioxide. Um, so you can have low or high ratios. The low VQ ratio would be more common, and that's where you have decreased ventilation or airflow, but you have normal perfusion. And the other, the high VQ ratio would be the opposite. Um, the third would be an intrapulmonary shunt, and that's just going to be where blood will pass through an area of the lung that's not ventilated. So that is not typically as common, but that would be things like an anatomic shunt, um, things like that. Diffusion impairment is also not very common, but that's going to be where the blood gas barrier that we had the picture of earlier is really thickened and diseased, um, so that gas exchange can't occur. Um, that's more common in humans. And then finally, if you have a low inspired oxygen concentration, um, like you're at a high altitude, something like that, then that would be an, another cause. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, hypoxemia does not equal hypoxia, so hypoxemia would be low oxygen concentration in the blood. Hypoxia is low oxygen in the tissues, so there can be other reasons why you might not be getting oxygen to your tissues, um, but these are the main causes for low oxygen in the blood. So another way to think about it, uh, probably more clinically, would be if you think about there's, there can be issues getting air into the lungs, so if you have upper airway obstructions, Pleural effusion is going to limit the ability to get air into the lungs, and then if your lower airways are damaged as well. If you have difficulty in gas exchange, that's going to be mostly problems there at the blood gas barrier, so things like pulmonary edema, cancer, um, hemorrhage, anything that can kind of get in the way of that barrier. And then finally, things outside of the lungs, um, like neurologic issues that can control the respiratory center in the brain, um, and then metabolic or acid-base disturbances a lot of times will cause dyspnea as well. So um, when looking at the patient on ER that comes in in respiratory distress, um, you know, after they're stabilized or whoever has the time to get a history first, uh, things to keep in mind would be how long has the problem been going on? Was it acute? Does the dog have a history of coughing? Things like that. Uh, previous medical problems, any medications that the pet is on, um, any recent anesthesia or sedation, and then any potential exposure to toxins. For your physical exam, obviously you're going to look at the rate and effort, um, mucous membranes, and then the pattern of breathing. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is might look funny, but try and breathe how the pet is breathing and decide, is it, are they having problems getting air in, pushing air out, is it upper airway, lower airway, things like that. But if you kind of try and breathe how they're breathing, it can kind of help you. Um, airflow, are they able to get airflow through their nose? So you can do the slide test. Um, tracheal palpation, do you get a cough when you palpate their trachea, things like that. Um, and then finally, auscultation, which we'll go through some things. So.
Um, this is just a chart of common respiratory sounds that you can hear. By far the most common one would be crackles, so those are going to be short, explosive sounds um, that can be characterized by their pitch, so they can be high or low, and then their timing. Do they occur on inspiration or expiration? <laughs> Wheezes are more of a continuous sound, and they sound kind of musical, um, but again, those can be classified according to their pitch or their timing. Um, strider is going to be more of a harsh, high-pitched sound, so oftentimes, like a dog with a laryngeal obstruction, will be striderous breathing versus stertorous breathing, um, which is more like a snoring problem with the pharynx, um, bulldogs type sounds. Um, this is a chart that I like. It kind of just lists out all the common diseases that different breeds of dogs get and then cats down here. Um, so, you know, it can be hard to localize and figure out what medication you should give right away. But if it's a Yorkie, you know, tracheal collapse would be probably a good guess. Toy poodles, bless their hearts, they can get everything. Tracheal collapse, bronchitis, heart disease, those are a little tougher. Um, but you can just kind of go down. Any flat-faced dog, pugs, bulldogs, brachycephalic airway syndrome should definitely be on your list. Um, Labradors like to get Larpar. Um, Huskies and Malamutes do get spontaneous pneumothorax, which is not that common, but I've um, definitely seen a few in those breeds. Dobermans like to get heart disease. Um, young puppies, um, obviously, you know, aspiration pneumonia, things like that. Um, but also they like to chew on things, so they could have electrical cord injury, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, things like that. And then young cats can get polyps or upper respiratory infections commonly. And then uh, Siamese cats like to get asthma. So those are just good things to keep in mind if you're stuck and not sure which direction to go. Just a little bit about how to localize where the problem is. And a lot of times there'll be problem in more than one area. Um, but it does help to kind of figure out where exactly your problem is because that's going to decide how you treat it. So for the upper airway, that would include the larynx, the nasopharynx, cervical trachea, and nasal passages. Um, with this, you're going to have inspiratory dyspnea. So um, they have increased resistance to getting air into their lungs. Um, so that's going to result in problems when they try to breathe in. Um, you can also hear loud, striderous breathing, like a, the dog with Larpar. Um, and you can hear referred upper airway noise. So when you listen over their chest, you really can't hear anything because of all the sounds coming from their airway. Um, it can also be worse if you listen over their larynx or trachea, which is something that I like to do. If I'm not quite sure where the noise is coming from, if you just listen right over their trachea, you can hear them trying to suck air in. It's quite sad. Um, so the most common diseases with the upper airway would be uh, laryngeal paralysis or collapse, elongated soft palate, um, bulldogs, and then tracheal collapse can be in the upper or lower airway depending on uh, where the problem is. So moving on down to the lower airways, um, specifically the bronchioles, um, that is going to result in more of an expiratory dyspnea. Um, so the airways are going to collapse or narrow when the pet tries to expire. So then you get an increased expiratory effort and often a push at the end of expiration. Um, but feline asthma would be the number one thing that you would see on an emergency basis for bronchial disease. The canine chronic bronchitis usually doesn't present as an emergency. A lot of times you'll see dogs with multiple problems, heart disease, PTE, and they also have bronchitis as well. For uh, moving down to the parenchyma, so the alveoli, this is where um, the majority of the problems are going to occur. This is where you're going to hear your crackles or your wet lungs. Um, so you can have disease within the alveoli itself. Um, so pulmonary edema would be the most common. Um, typically, you know, I like to keep it simple and think what well, can be in that airway causing a problem. It could either be blood, so heart failure, contusions, if there's a history of trauma, um, pus, pneumonia, or water, things like vasculitis or ARDS. Um, the interstitium is if you remember back to that picture, kind of the area between the alveoli and the bloodstream, the, everything that can get in the alveoli usually starts out in the interstitium first, and then once it's more severe, it gets into the alveolus. So other things like neoplasia, parasitic disease, pulmonary thromboembolism, that can also all occur in the interstitium as well.
The pleural space um, is also an, a common area to see disease on emergency. With disease in the pleural space, obviously you have problems expanding your lungs and getting in air into the lungs. So um, how that presents is typically like an asynchronous breathing pattern. Um, when the pet is supposed to be breathing in air, you may see a push coming out from their abdomen. So it just doesn't match up. The, the main thing would be decreased lung sounds. So um, decreased lung sounds dorsally would indicate uh, pneumothorax. Decreased lung sounds ventrally would indicate pleural effusion. Um, there's multiple causes of pleural effusion, which we'll go into a bit later. The other main thing that can be get trapped in there would be organs, so di diaphragmatic hernia, usually from trauma, but they can be congenital forms as well. And then finally, um, Outside of the lungs, you can have neuromuscular diseases that affect the respiratory center, and then respiratory lookalikes, which typically occur due to metabolic or endocrine disease um, that can result in acid base disturbances, so the body can overcompensate, and it looks like it's a respiratory problem, but it's actually not. So, just as if it weren't complicated enough, that can also happen. So typically, um, when I see a dyspneic patient present um, on the ER, the first thing that you need to do is, is stabilize. So supplemental oxygen, obviously I think everyone runs for that. Sedation can be your friend, but just also remember that it, most sedatives will also cause a little bit of respiratory depression, so you don't want to give them too much because that may push them over the edge in the wrong direction. Uh, but typically, butorphanol and ACE are the most common ones that I will go to. Usually start with TORB, and if that doesn't cut it, or if it's a bulldog or something, or a dog with Larpar, then ACE promazine is usually needed. A lot of times these pets will also come in very hyperthermic. They've been, you know, they're struggling to breathe, so their body temperature rises. Um, so definitely controlling that by cooling the pet is important. Um, thoracocentesis would be one of the initial stabilizing things that you could do if you found that. Um, and then treating for underlying disease, um, if you know it, like if the pet has a history of heart disease and you hear crackles, go ahead and give Lasix. Or just treating for something that you think is most common, most likely, um, and seeing if the patient responds or not. Um, once the patient is more stable, then you can go into your diagnostics. So again, trying to assess oxygenation, um, blood gas, if able, pulse oximetry is obviously a little easier to obtain. Uh, and then, you know, getting your imaging, so your chest x-rays, just make sure the pet's stable enough. You don't, nothing ever dies in x-ray, as they said in vet school. So um, don't stress out a pet just to get an image. Um, thoracic ultrasound or TFAST um, can be a little easier because the pet can sit sternally, so they're not as stressed while someone holds oxygen on them. So that is a good trick to have if you have an ultrasound machine in your clinic. And then continued support may need, uh, may indicate, you know, the pet needs to be intubated. Uh, the pet may need a tracheostomy too. If, if there's an airway obstruction, you can't obtain an airway. And then you may need to manually ventilate the pet as well. So oxygen, obviously there's different ways um, to get oxygen into our pets. Flow by is the most common um, first thing when the pet comes in. Uh, that can include face mask or just the tubing. Uh, nasal oxygen is pretty easy to place. Uh, and it's good for larger dogs who won't fit in little oxygen cages. Um, you can also make an oxygen hood from an e-collar and cellophane wrap. And then oxygen cages if you have them, or the little doors that you can apply to cages. Uh, and then finally, intubation and ventilating for the pet sometimes is necessary if all the other oxygen therapies aren't working. So for the thoracic ultrasound, you know, it's pretty easy to use for abdominal injuries and, and maybe people don't use it as much for this neck pets, um, but it can be beneficial. So um, the TFAS, which I'll talk about, just stands for Thoracic Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. That's what it stands for. Um, and it can be helpful in detecting pleural or pericardial effusion, pneumothorax, and then other injuries to the chest wall. Um, so this is just a picture of kind of where to look. So there's typically four sites to look at. Basically the CTS up here is the chest tube site. So like just think about where would you put a chest tube? Up high. And then the pericardial site would obviously be down near the heart. So you want to look and both 
uh, both spots on both sides, so it's a total of four sites. Um, there is, in the later papers that they're coming out with, they're looking at a fifth site, which is basically from the diaphragm looking up towards the heart, which is a pretty good image um, to get as well. You can get a lot of information from that. It's a little hard to look at lung ultrasounds if you've never done it before, but the basics are pretty straightforward. This is a normal lung ultrasound. Um, so you're looking at what they call a bat sign, which I don't really see, but maybe some of y'all will. So the, the black are here are the ribs, and then this white line here is the pleural pulmonary interface, so where the pleural space and the lungs meet. In real time, that's going to glide back and forth, and that's going to be your brightest white line. And that's what a normal lung would look like. Abnormal lungs, you'll see some shadowing of the white line kind of streaking down like this, and that's what they call lung rockets or comet tails, depending on you know, if you're reading a radiology book or like a critical care book. Um, but basically, that indicates some disease in the airway. Um, probably if you took a chest x-ray, they'd be kind of lighted out lungs. So for thoracic trauma, you can see that normal white line is, there's a little thing here called a step sign. So it's down a little further, so that could indicate injuries to the chest wall. A pneumothorax is a little harder to detect if some of you are astute uh, or paying attention. This is the same picture I just showed you of the normal ultrasound. The only difference is you're not going to see the lungs gliding back and forth. So normally you should see kind of a back and forth movement of the lungs, but if you don't, that indicates there's air in the pleural space. So that one's kind of harder to detect. And then obviously you can see pleural effusion um, from multiple views, but usually more ventrally. And then pericardial effusion, you can also detect with the ultrasound. Um, just be careful that you're, you confirm it's pericardial effusion on multiple views, because sometimes, especially in larger dogs, the ventricles can look like effusion. You definitely don't want to put a needle in the ventricle. Then that'd be good. So other diagnostics, once the pet's more stable, chest x-rays, echocardiograms can be helpful if you're trying to rule out heart disease. If you're able to get a nice view like this with your um, handheld ultrasound machine, which rarely happens, you can um, look at the LAAO ratio, and that is the left atrium, which is this big chamber here, to the aorta, which is this little chamber. So if you take those measurements, normally it should be about one to one. Um, if it's higher than that, that indicates um, enlarged left atrium, likely left-sided heart failure. Blood work can be helpful, and then, you know, if you still can't figure it out or we're looking at tertiary diagnostics, things like washes, lavage, CT, and scoping would be something later on down the road, obviously not something we're going to do when the pet comes in. And then, you know, finally, if you, we can't stabilize the pet, then sometimes they do need mechanical ventilation. Um, typically, if you have a pet with a PaO2 of less than 50 and a PaCO2 of greater than 50, then they should probably be on a mechanical ventilator. Uh, that's obviously labor intensive and expensive. Um, at your clinic, you can always manually ventilate the pet until the owner decides what to do or you get more information, things like that. So now we'll go into some case examples, hopefully put it in a little bit more perspective for you guys. So the first one is Buddy. Buddy is a 12-year-old male neutered Labrador who collapsed while on a walk in the 90 degree heat. Um, and the owner says that recently he had a change in the sound of his bark. So when he comes in, Buddy can be heard all the way down the hall as he's rushed back on a gurney. Um, he's cyanotic, he has very loud breathing, and he sounds like he's gasping for air. So if you, like, I don't know if you noticed, it sounds like, well, obviously the smacking when he opened his mouth, but then it sounds like he's trying to suck air through a little tiny straw. So he has laryngeal paralysis, um, which is very common in Labradors, specifically middle to older aged Labradors. And the problem occurs uh, when there's damage to the cricoarytenoides dorsalis muscle. Um, so the purpose of that muscle is to adduct the larynx. Um, so if you see in this picture, this is a normal <laughs> larynx. 
open, nice open airway here. These cartilages are pulled back. With laryngeal paralysis, that innervation to those muscles is lost, so it collapses down. So when they get into distress, they try to breathe more air in, and then that causes it to collapse even further, so it's a, a perpetuating cycle there. Clinical signs are inspiratory strider, um, which that dog was a pretty mar like <coughs> marked example of. Um, but they can have subtle changes, like a voice change um, a couple weeks before, um, exercise and heat intolerance. So especially this, you know, we'll see these present a lot in the summer or like after a swim, things like that. Um, treatment is flow by oxygen. These guys do really well with sedation, um, typically ace promazine. I usually start with like a 0.01 mg per kg dose. You can go all the way up to 0.5 mg per kg. Um, Butorphanol is also another good one. I usually start with 0.2 mg per kg um, IM. And then uh, oftentimes they'll need steroids just for secondary inflammation. Usually like a 0.2 to 0.4 mg per kg of DEX SP. Um, ultimately, you know, they benefit from surgery. Not every pet with LARPAR needs surgery, and it's certainly something that we don't like to do on an emergency basis, but once they're more stable, uh, they can come back in and talk to the surgeon about um, fixing that airway. Second case is Sam. He's a four-year-old Abyssinian, so this is obviously not Sam. Um, but he presents for open mouth breathing. He has a history of coughing several times a day for the last week. Um, both of his owners are smokers. So when he comes in, his temperature is 100.1. His respiratory rate is 70. His heart rate is 200. He's open mouth breathing and drooling. Um, you don't hear a murmur, but you do hear some wheezes. And he's got shallow breathing with an increased expiratory effort. Here's his x-rays. So, I mean, you can see some bronchial pattern here, some train tracks. The heart does not look enlarged. Uh, Sam has asthma. So the pathogenesis, um, you get basically cellular inflammatory response. They don't really know why it happens. Um, it can be to irritants in the environment, such as smoke, perfumes, aerosols, etc. Um, and basically the airway, just the, infl the inflammatory cells start going haywire. So you get hyperreactivity to all the inflammation, which causes more inflammation, and then they present in distress clinical signs, you can see the increased expiratory effort, rapid shallow breathing, coughing or wheezing is uh, pretty common in asthma cats. So asthma is the most common cause of coughing in cats. And 75% of cats in one study had a history of coughing or wheezing. So pretty common. And again, Siamese cats are overrepresented for whatever reason. Diagnosis is usually with x-rays. Um, if you really want to go further, you can do a tracheal wash or a bronchoscopy. Uh, on your tracheal wash or your bronchoalveolar wash, you'll see a large amount of eosinophils. Treatment um, is with steroids. So um, on an emergency basis, we usually give uh, DEX-SP, um, 0.25 mg per kg dose, um, usually to start. Um, also bronchodilators are pretty helpful. Um, so we'll often use terbutaline because it's injectable. Um, you can use aminophilin as well. Albuterol is typically the first inhaler we'll go for, so two puffs in a crisis um, can help. You can repeat that every 30 minutes to two hours. Um, if you use that chronically, though, it can cause more inflammation in the airway, so um, typically like long-term management, we'll send them home on oral steroids and start um, a steroid inhaler, and then the owners can have the albuterol at home just in cases of emergency. Obviously oxygen, usually these cats don't need sedation, but sometimes they do, especially if they're fractious. Um, but typically steroids and bronchodilators are going to be your mainstays of treatment. This is a chart just of some doses of things that you can go home with. Um, so prednisone, terbutaline, theophyll, and things like that. Um, they can commonly get secondary, secondary bacterial infections, um, so sometimes we will also start antibiotics as well usually doxycycline. Um, the third case is Missy, another cat, a 14-year-old domestic short hair, um, who was found to be in respiratory distress under the bed. Um, she presents with a temperature of 98.3, also open mouth breathing. Her respiratory rate is 70, and she's got a restrictive breathing pattern, um, so she's taking short, shallow breaths. 
Her heart sounds are muffled and she has quiet lung sounds ventrally. Here's Missy's chest x-rays. You can see the cardiac silhouette's pretty obscured, can't really make it out. You've got some pleural fissure lines. Here's your ultrasound as well. So the diaphragm, left ventricle of the heart, and then fluid. So she has pleural effusion, which is also very common in cats. And so typically, we classify effusions based on their protein count um, and uh, cell counts. So transudates are pretty rare as a cause of pleural effusion. That would be due to very low protein levels. Uh, modified transudates are going to be more common. Um, and typically, especially in cats, congestive heart failure is going to be one of the more co common causes for pleural effusion. Uh, cancer as well. And then chylothorax would be what this is a picture of here, kind of milky white um, fluid. So all three of those are quite common in cats. Um, but definitely the modified transudate is going to be the most common type. Exudates can be seen, um, pyothorax, most of the pyothoraxes I have seen have been in cats, um, so that's also something to consider, um, but really analyzing the fluid is pretty useful if you're not sure the cause of the effusion. Um, so to diagnose, um, chest x-rays and thoracic ultrasound are, are pretty diagnostic. Um, you know, you can, if just by listening, um, if the pets are really unstable, you can go ahead and try and tap them and see if you get anything. Blood work would be more to figure out why they have pleural effusion. Again, the fluid analysis, um, submission for pathology as well. Sometimes you can see cancer cells, things like that. Echocardiogram would be to rule out heart failure, and abdominal ultrasound would be to look for cancer or other places in the body. Treatment is obviously going to be to remove the fluid with thoracocentesis and then to treat whatever underlying cause it is. So we'll go in a little bit about thoracocentesis. Supplies that you would need, clippers, scrub, gloves. Um, in cats, I like to use a butterfly needle. If it's a fat cat, I'll have to use like an over-the-needle catheter, um, just like you would put an IV. An extension set, um, and a three-way stopcock, and then your syringe. And then your tubes for collection and analysis. For pleural effusion, uh, I typically think sternal recumbency is easier. You can do it in lateral recumbency, especially if you're getting air, if you're going for <laughs> pneumothorax. Um, but you want to aim between the seventh and ninth intercostal space. And you want to insert your needle cranial to the rib um, because the vessels run caudal to the rib. Um, so for fluid, you want to aim low. Air, you want to aim high. If you do have an ultrasound machine, um, either you or your assistant can put the probe and watch yourself go in. Um, you want to wash the hub for fluid if you're aspirating for fluid, and then you want to attach your tubing and then aspirate until you get negative pressure. So some complications would be like hemorrhage, um, iatrogenic pneumothorax, um, or cardiac puncture, but if you're using a small butterfly needle or an over-the-needle catheter, uh, those are pretty rare, and they obviously need the procedure, so you have to, you have to do it. For a uh, chest tube placement, um, indications for that would be something like a tension pneumothorax, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, or if you have a pneumothorax that's continuing to leak um, despite you know repeated attempts, usually after like three or four um, thoracocentesis, um, then I would recommend a chest tube at that point. A pyothorax is best treated with chest tubes because um, that fluid can be really thick and hard to get out. Um, chylothorax as well, and then any sort of penetrating chest injury. So the traditional chest tubes is what's shown in this picture here, which is the trocar chest tubes, which is best placed surgically under general anesthesia. Um, there are newer, like low profile Mila chest tubes that are much easier to place. It's basically like just doing a regular thoracocentesis. The needle is a little longer, um, so it's a catheter. So you basically like placing a jugular catheter. It's probably about the same size as a jugular catheter. And you insert the stylet and put the catheter over the needle and then pull it out. So you can do that with 
just light sedation. Sometimes you don't even need sedation. So those are pretty nice. Obviously, they're not good for really thick exudates, um, but they, they are easier and they don't require uh, general anesthesia. But uh, this is just guidelines for placing a typical trocar chest tube. You want to get basically sterile. Um, pet needs to be under general anesthesia, uh, whatever size chest tube you're using. Um, clip and prep, um, and then you want to have your assistant pull the skin forward. Um, I typically make a small incision into the skin, even when I'm using the Mila catheters, just because it's easier to puncture the skin um, if there's already a stab incision. And then you want to uh, place the chest tube through the incision and then have the assistant release the skin, and then you kind of create a tunnel for the tube. And then with the trocar, you got to kind of choke down on it and push really hard, which is a little scary. So that's why I like the Mila is better. Um, and then you want to confirm that you're in the right place radiographically. Some common mistakes would be to be in a subcutaneous space. Obviously, if you're getting your fluid or your air, uh, there's a good chance you're in the right spot and then kind of secure it. And then you set it up to whatever drainage system you want. So passive drainage is the most common, and that's where you manually have someone go in every couple hours and aspirate the chest tube. Um, continuous drainage would be through one of these devices, like a Pluravac. Um, so basically, uh, the drainage from the patient would come through one of these, and then it comes out into, if it's air, it goes into an empty bottle. If it's fluid, you can actually measure it, but it continuously pulls air or fluid out. So those are nice to have. Complications are the same ones as um, with thoracocentesis. Um, with the bigger trocars, obviously there's a greater risk for things like hemorrhage, um, infection, damage to some viscera like the lungs. Um, they can get re-expansion pulmonary edema. That's typically if chest tubes are placed after surgery, like thoracotomy. Um, and in human medicine, the complication from chest tubes is about 20 to 30 percent. The next case is Tank. Tank is a one-year-old male neutered English bulldog who is at the dog park playing fetch when he suddenly lied down below a tree and refused to get up. Not that uncommon for bulldogs. Um, but he did have significant stirter uh, the entire time, but this is normal for him according to the owner. Um, he came in with a temperature of 107. He was panting and cyanotic. He had severe stirter and respiratory effort, and you were unable to escalt his heart because he was breathing so loudly. Tank has uh, brachycephalic airway syndrome, which is very common, obviously, in brachycephalic dogs. Um, the main four abnormalities that these dogs have are stenotic nares, elongated soft palates, inverted laryngeal saccules, and a hypoplastic trachea. And this is all due to their conformation and breeding. Um, but eventually, all four of these can lead to laryngeal or tracheal collapse, which is kind of end-stage uh, brachycephalic airway syndrome. Treatment um, initially for tank would be sedation. Torb and ACE, again, are going to be your friends. ACE, again, at 0.01 and Torb at 0.2 is typically where I would start. Um, and I would do one first, and then if you need to, do the other. Don't do them both at the same time. Um, midazolam is not typically something I would use, but if you've Sometimes they require multiple boluses of ACE and TORB, so uh, sometimes midazolam can help take the edge off too. Um, oxygen, cooling, um, here's a little ice bath, but um, cold water blankets, fans, things like that, anything to kind of calm them down. Um, steroids are helpful for inflammation in the back of the airway. And then ultimately, these dogs would benefit from surgery to correct their airway. Again, just like with LARPAR, part, it's not something that we typically like to do on an emergency basis, so we prefer to get them out of crisis, send them home, and have them come back when they're calmer to talk to a surgeon. Recommending airway surgery earlier in life probably would be beneficial for these dogs, like at the time of spay or neuter. Um, so speaking of upper airway obstructions, um, here's just a table of initial drugs to try. Again, the butorphanol ACE, dexamethasone, or prednisone. If that fails, sometimes you do have to anesthetize and intubate the patient. Um, a lot of times we'll just grab propofol and kind of get them down and intubate them until they've calmed down, temperatures down, and then slowly wake them up. Sometimes that fails as well, and if that is the case and you can't get a tube into them, then you may have to do um, a tracheostomy.
so for an emergency tracheostomy, obviously it's not going to be as controlled or sterile as a surgical tracheostomy. Um, but typically, you want to place the pet um, in dorsal recumbency and make a ventral central uh, cervical midline incision uh, from the cricoid towards the sternum. So usually about maybe four or five inches. Uh, then you want to separate the sternohyoid muscles bluntly with scissors. And uh, for the actual trachea itself, there's two different ways to do it. You can make a transverse incision between the third and fourth uh, tracheal rings or the fourth and fifth tracheal rings. Um, if you do the transverse, your incision should not take up more than 65% of the trachea itself. Um, the vertical incision, I think, is more common, and that's just vertically through about two tracheal rings. The location is not as important for um, the vertical incision. Um, once you do that, um, place long loops of stay suture around adjacent tracheal rings, um, which is what this first picture is showing. Um, that way you can just pull open the trachea and pop your tube right in, which is what the second picture is. The tube itself usually has holes on either side and you can use umbilical tape to tie it around the neck. Uh, you want to be sure and label your stay sutures up and down so if a crisis happens you can grab them real quick and know which way to pull. Uh, once you're ready to take out the tracheostomy tube, you want to leave the incision open. Also, you want to leave it open while the pet's in the hospital, too. You don't want to close it. To manage a pet with a tracheostomy tube, it does require uh, pretty constant nursing care. Um, so they frequently have to be suctioned, uh, the airway needs to be nebulized, and the tube needs to be cleaned. Um, which, you know, depending on how much exudate's coming out, can be anywhere from every two hours to every six hours. Uh, once the pet is ready to have the tube removed, again, leave the incision site open to heal via second intention. So they will have a hole there, so obviously no swimming or anything like that. Um, so this is just kind of a picture of what one would look like. This is a little bulldog here with all of his neck skin, but uh, that's the tracheostomy tube, and it's tied around his neck there. Complications of tracheostomy tubes include things like um, occlusion of the tube or dislodgement. That can happen if the pet lies on the tube or if there's like really um, exudative secretions that come out of the tube. They can get subcutaneous emphysema, they can get a pneumothorax, um, they can aspirate fluid um, if they have a water dish laying near their tube, they can get pneumonia, and then they can have arrhythmias that can occur during suctioning or when you're cleaning the tube. So the fifth case is Jocko. He's a two-year-old male neutered boxer who accidentally escaped from the yard and was hit by a car. He has not walked since the incident, and he had significant trouble breathing the entire way to the hospital. On presentation, his respiratory rate was 80 with marked effort um, with abdominal muscle movement when he breathes. He is laterally recumbent, pale, and had dull to absent lung sounds on the right. Here's his classic x-ray. So you can see the heart's lifted off the sternum. It's not great quality. Um, but he has a pneumothorax from trauma. So um, there was one study in dogs that were hit by a car with pulmonary contusions, and they found that 47% of them also had a pneumothorax as well. Um, so trauma is by far the most common cause of a pneumothorax in um, dogs and cats. Spontaneous pneumothorax can also occur in huskies. Um, that can be from a ruptured bulla, um, neoplasia, and there are some reports of feline asthma cats um, having spontaneous pneumothorax. And then iatrogenic, like if you're doing a thoracocentesis for fluid, things like that. Generally those are mild and resolve with time and you don't need to do anything about them. So to diagnose a pneumothorax, that is something that you can diagnose on auscultation alone, especially with a history of being hit by a car. Um, if you just compare the lung sounds dorsally to the lung sounds ventrally, um, if you don't have time to get the patient into radiology or the patient's really declining, you can always just try uh, thoracocentesis and generally, you know, your, your gut sounds are good wherever even if I have an x-ray, I'll just kind of listen, and wherever the lung sounds are the quietest, that's where I'll tap the chest. Um, but you can do x-rays to confirm. Thoracic ultrasound, like we talked about earlier, is a little harder, but you can diagnose the pneumothorax that way. And then a CT scan would be more for um, if they're having continuous air leakage or you think it's, you know, there's no history of trauma and you're looking for bulla or blebs.
Treatment, again, is going to be thoracocentesis. Like we talked about earlier, it's the same concept. You're just going to go higher for air. And the PET can be a lateral uh, for this procedure as well. Uh, the thoracotomy tube, like we talked about, if you're having to do more than like three or four intermittent uh, thoracocentesis, maybe consider doing a chest tube. And then obviously if you need to go in for an exploratory thoracotomy on a spontaneous uh, pneumo, then a chest tube would be indicated at that time as well. Um, the overall prognosis for pneumothorax is pretty good. About 86% will survive. Um, one study found that favorable prognostic indicators included the absence of dyspnea. Um, if you didn't need to tap their chest, a lot of times when hit by car cases will find a mild pneumo, but they never require thoracocentesis. Um, a longer ICU stay in dogs was found to be favorable, and a normal body temperature on presentation was favorable in cats. So these guys can do pretty well. Another common thing that can happen in trauma cases, especially hit by cars, would be pulmonary contusions. Um, so that these occur from interstitial and alveolar hemorrhage. Um, so it can begin immediately after impact, but worsens over the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, treatment is just supportive, oxygen, fluids, pain medications, and they typically resolve on their own in about three to 10 days. Um, survival rates for contusions is about 82% reported in the literature. Uh, our next case is Buttercup. She is an 11-year-old female spade Shih Tzu who's been coughing more and having progressive trouble breathing over the past three days at home. On exam, she is cyanotic and very dystonic. She has a 5 out of 6 systolic murmur and she has diffuse crackles. Here are her x-rays. Very large heart here and pulmonary edema in the perihilar region. So she has congestive heart failure, so cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which occurs due to increased hydrostatic pressure and the pulmonary capillaries secondary to left-sided heart failure. Um, so the most common heart diseases that cause congestive heart failure, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, would be mitral valve disease, which is probably what Buttercup has, dilated cardiomyopathy like Doberman's, and then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats. Um, treatment is oxygen and furosemide. So typically, one to four mgs per kg, boluses every two to eight hours. Um, I usually start at two mgs per kg in dogs and one mg per kg in cats go up as needed. Uh, sometimes they can be dystonic enough where they need a CRI. Um, and again, cats are more sensitive, which is why I typically go for a lower dose um, for kitties. If they're not responsive to Lasix, you can do um, nitroglycerin paste on the ear. Um, or a natural preside CRI, um, which requires constant blood pressure monitoring. It can be quite expensive, but it can be effective. The other common treatment will start right away without even an echocardiogram for heart failure would be pemobendin to improve contractility, and that would be in dogs only. Um, cats, you, there is more studies showing that pemobendin is effective in cats, but without an echo, um, I would be a little hesitant to do that, but for dogs, definitely pemobendin can be helpful. I usually wait and start things like enalapril or other ACE inhibitors um, when they leave the hospital and they're eating well. It's not something I do in the hospital, typically. Um, so there's other causes of pulmonary edema, and typically those are broadly categorized as non-cardiogenic. Can, they can occur due to increased permeability. Um, this would be damage to the alveolar epithelium. Like we talked about way back earlier, all that surfactant and those layers that the oxygen has to diffuse through. If there's any damage to that, that can cause fluid leakage, um, and that fluid's going to have a high protein content. So this would be um, your patients with SIRS or sepsis that become acutely dyspneic. Um, so these are typically harder to treat and usually do worse than uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, there's also mixed cause edema, which um, I think just as time goes on, they find out more causes, so they kind of break it down. So neurogenic pulmonary edema um, is more common, and that can occur after head trauma, seizures, or electrical cord injury. So the little puppies that bite electrical cords can get uh, neurogenic edema, and that occurs to uh, an increased release of sympathetic neurons. Um, and then also they think it's due to the high protein leaking from the vasculature.
Negative pressure edema can occur after upper airway obstruction or strangulation. Um, and they think, again, that's similar sympathetic release causing um, edema formation that way. The treatment for these types is oxygen and to treat the underlying cause. There is some controversy as to whether Lasix helps these or not. If the pet's declining, I might try a dose. Um, it usually doesn't make much of a difference. They really just need oxygen and time. Case 7 is Kiki. Um, she is a 10-year-old female spade Yorkie with acute onset dyspnea at home. And when she presents to your clinic, she's cyanotic. These are her x-rays. She's got a lot crammed in her little chest. Her heart looks pretty big, but her trachea is just really tiny right here. It's not a lot there. So Kiki, being a Yorkie and given her x-rays and the way that she sounds, um, has tracheal collapse, which is a deficiency of the tracheal cartilage uh, matrix. Um, so normally the trachea will collapse dorsoventrally, and this can occur in the cervical region, within the thorax itself, or in both spots. Uh, it's common in toy breeds, particularly Yorkies, and it's an irreversible progressive disease. So once the trachea collapses, you know, it's kind of intermittent in um, how, how much it collapses, but eventually, you know, it's not something that we can reverse. Um, so they, they, it can be graded. You have to do bronchoscopy to do that, so I'm not as familiar with that. Um, but you can see this would be normal. Trachea is nice and open. Grade 1 is just a little collapsed. Grade 2, a little more. Grade 3 is looking pretty rough. And then by 4, there's no way you're getting air into that. There are factors that can exacerbate signs, so it is irreversible, but um, things that the owners can do at home can kind of help prevent progression. So keeping the pet thin, so obesity can definitely exacerbate signs. Uh, anesthesia can worsen things as well. Uh, secondary bacterial infections are pretty common, um, so that can make things worse for them. Environmental irritants, similar to your kitties with asthma, um, having you know a lot of smells in the home can make things worse. Uh, stress or excitement can as well. If the pet is unlucky enough to have cardio cardiac disease, cardiomegaly can also uh, make it worse, um, collapse the mainstem bronchi, and then any sort of trauma to the neck region as well. So that's why um, you see this picture of the Yorkie in the harness. Um, so no neck leads for for dogs with tracheal collapse. Clinical signs are what we heard in Kiki, um, the honking, dry cough, um, and also a cough elicited during exercise or excitement and on tracheal palpation. You can diagnose it on radiographs as we did in Kiki, um, and then you can also, if you want to grade it, that would be more fluoroscopy and tracheal bronchoscopy. Emergency treatment. Um, Similar to m many of the other diseases, they're going to be oxygen, sedation to kind of calm them down, uh, steroids to uh, decrease any inflammation in the, airway, in the airway. Bronchodilators can help as well. Um, typically, we'll go with terbutaline. Uh, once they get home or even in the hospital, they can be started on a cough suppressant, typically um, hydrocodone or hycodin. Um, you know, say to owners that they can give it up to four times a day at home as needed. Um, usually it's worse at night, so having them give it before bed is helpful. Um, and occasionally we'll start antibiotics for secondary infections. Um, so typically broad spectrum, but doxycycline is the most common, uh, commonly prescribed antibiotic for dogs with tracheal collapse. So medical management, again, will be like things like hydrocodone at home, bronchodilators. Um, sometimes we'll send them home with a tapering course of steroids if it's a pretty severe event. Um, antibiotics, wear a harness, lose weight. More kind of permanent solutions would be things like tracheal stenting and surgery. Not a lot of owners will go for those. They can be helpful. This is a picture of a tracheal stent in a dog. Um, both of those can have pretty significant complications, but it's really the only way to kind of open that airway back up um, as it is you know, an irreversible process. Case 8 is Lola. She is a 5-month-old female intact Chessie who has been having diarrhea and vomiting several times at daycare. The owner came home and found her breathing heavily and very lethargic. 
When she comes in, her temperature is 104.3. She has normal heart sounds. Um, she has increased bronchovesicular sounds uh, with expiratory wheezes, and you're not hearing any crackles. Here are her x-rays. You can see an alveolar pattern kind of right over the heart base here, kind of in the right middle lung lobe. Uh, so she has aspiration pneumonia. So if you read any critical care books or um, probably talk to a human um, intensivist, they will talk to you about the difference between aspiration pneumonia and aspiration pneumonitis. Uh, the difference being one is infectious and one is not. Um, so every time you aspirate, you're not always going to get pneumonia, but the actual chemical irritation from aspirating, typically stomach contents, can cause inflammation itself, which can cause dyspnea and signs that we see with aspiration pneumonia. Um, so the pathogenesis is kind of, it starts with that, the direct chemical injury from aspirating, um, and then the inflammatory cascade that occurs after that. Um, that results in um, increased permeability edema, and then the infection itself can occur due to bacteria colonizing because of all the inflammatory cells that are there, or if you directly aspirate contaminated material like uh, drowning victims, things like that, that aspirate dirty water, um, that can cause pneumonia as well. Um, so there are many diseases, many, uh, that predispose patients to aspiration. If you think about pets that have large volumes of intragastric food or fluid, so um, dogs that eat fast, dogs um, with bloat, things like that, anything where they're going to have a large stomach, uh, dogs with ileus for whatever reason, they're at higher risk for aspiration. Um, dogs with esophageal disorders, so mega esophagus, um, any sort of strictures, things like that. Pets with impaired consciousness, um, so general anesthesia is a big risk factor, uh, sedation, uh, neurologic disease, things like that. And then dogs with impaired airway function, so the brachycephalic dog um, who can't close off his epiglottis is obviously at higher risk for aspiration. Clinical signs are typically a history of vomiting, um, history of anesthesia, other predisposing factors. Typically they present an acute respiratory distress. Uh, they may or may not have a fever. They may or may not have uh, mucopurulent nasal discharge. Uh, usually they'll have increased lung sounds as well. Diagnosis is based on x-rays. Um, typically that alveolar pattern that we saw in the right middle lung lobe is most common. Blood work, you can do tracheal wash to see what um, kind of organisms you would grow there. Um, and then if you want to get really fancy, you can do bronchoscopy and things like that. Typically you get the diagnosis before that. Um, treatment is to manage the airway, so make sure they're able to breathe on their own. Um, this would be more important for post-anesthesia aspirations, things like that. If there's any concern, go ahead and intubate them, uh, let them wake up slowly, things like that, suction the airway. Um, oxygen. Broad spectrum antibiotics, um, Unison here is my favorite, that's why I put a picture up there. Uh, cardiovascular support, so fluid therapy, antiemetics to prevent further nausea and vomiting. Nebulization and coupage can be helpful. We typically do it about every six hours for our pneumonia patients. Bronchodilators may also help just open up the airways. It's not something I typically use, but you can. And then mechanical ventilation if it's very severe. Case nine is Trix. She is a 10-year-old female spade domestic short hair, indoor-outdoor kitty, who uh, was found in the yard, recumbent, minimally responsive. On exam, her heart sculpts normally. She has uh, poor pulses. Her lung sounds are increased on both sides. She's non-ambulatory, uh, but she can move her hind limbs. She has two small wounds over her right lateral thorax, and she has frayed nails on her forelimbs. Here's her blood work. She's got a mild hyperglycemia. Creatinine is up a little. Her lactate is up. And she's got some electrolyte disturbances. So initially, um, you're not quite sure what's going on with Trix, but you stabilize her with oxygen, fluids, pain medication, um, and antibiotics. And then you can take some x-rays. And that's your lateral view and your VD view. So I think the lateral view is pretty easy to see that there's a defect in the diaphragm. This looks to be the liver herniated through. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell which organs are herniated through. It's just like a blob of organs. But if you take the x-ray further back into the abdomen, then you can see what organs are missing. And then on the VD view, 
the liver is kind of up here in the chest where it should not be. So she has diaphragmatic hernia, probably from some sort of trauma. Who knows what happened? She was outside. Um, but usually trauma is the most common cause. So about 85% of cases will be from trauma. Um, there are congenital diaphragmatic hernias that often go undetected for years and don't cause the pet any problem. Um, but typically trauma cases are the ones that we see most commonly in ER. Um, so the liver is the most commonly herniated organ. It's right there next to the diaphragm, so that makes sense. So what, what can happen is a sudden increase in pressure in the abdominal cavity increases uh, that pressure gradient between the pleural space and the lungs, and then you get a tear in the diaphragm, and then the organs herniate through. Uh, clinical signs, they can be in respiratory distress or they can be pretty stable. Um, sometimes you just incidentally will find this in a trauma case and they don't actually present as dyspneic as you might think. Um, but they're typically hypoxemic. Um, they can also have pleural effusion commonly as well. Uh, lung sounds are usually quiet ventrally, again because um, you know we're going to have an organ in there in the pleural space so you won't be able to hear the lungs as well. Um, sometimes you can hear gut sounds over the thorax, which is kind of creepy. And if you have a herniated stomach, that is concerning and you can see um, compression of the caudal vena cava and the patient can decline pretty rapidly. So they can often be hypotensive, um, bradycardic, in pretty significant distress if you have the stomach herniated through. Diagnosis is usually with x-rays or thoracic ultrasound, um, if you're, and that can be helpful to determine what organs are herniated as well. Treatment, um, as we did in Trix's case, you want to stabilize the pet first with oxygen, fluids, pain meds. Um, again, this is usually in a trauma case, so as you would normally treat a patient that presents for trauma. Ultimately, they usually need surgery, um, the timing of which is controversial. There's people that say the sooner to fix it, the better. Um, there was one study that found that pets that were taken to surgery for diaphragmatic hernia within 24 hours had a worse prognosis. Um, typically, what we'll do is, if the patient is stable, um, we'll usually wait until, like if it comes in overnight, we'll wait until the next day or, give, or wait until they're more stable. If we can't stabilize them because they're so dyspneic, then you may have to go in emergently for surgery. Another indication to not wait on surgery would be if you have uh, small intestines or a stomach within the thorax, and that needs to be um, taken care of right away. Uh, so our next case is Sadie. She is a nine-year-old female spade dachshund with a history of Cushing's disease that is not treated. Um, she has a recent history of vomiting, um, and she presents in respiratory distress. She has a grade two out of six heart murmur, and she has increased lung sounds um, kind of all over. These are her x-rays. Not the best quality, but they don't look too exciting to me. Heart doesn't look huge, maybe on this one. Um, so we're still not really sure what's going on with her. So we do full blood work, pretty unremarkable. She's got some mild increases in her liver values, but her CBC is normal. Her SNAP PLI is abnormal, so she's probably got some pancreatitis going on. Um, her pulse ox on room air is about 92%. Um, you do an echocardiogram and she has mild valve disease, but a normal left atrium, so she's not in heart failure. She has a pulmonary thromboembolism. Um, which can be very hard to diagnose and often the x-rays appear normal and it's a kind of a process of elimination or the presence of diseases associated with a pulmonary thromboembolism or a PTE. Um, so in dogs and cats the most common diseases associated with a PTE are IMHA, neoplasia, protein losing nephropathy or enteropathy, Cushing's disease, heart disease, sepsis, and trauma. Um, there are several others, but those are typically the most common. This picture here is a pulmonary angiogram. So these are the pulmonary vessels that are lit up. And it's hard to tell, but that arrow is pointing to a filling defect, which is very hard to see, even where I'm standing, but trust me, it's there. Typically, pulmonary thromboembolisms occur with a disruption to Verkau's triad, which um, something probably we all wanted to forget, but basically um, a thrombus can form when you have damage to a vessel wall, if you have stasis of blood, or if you have a hypercoagulable state, which Cushing's is a known hypercoagulable state. So any disruption in these three can lead to clot formation. And the result is that you get a, a 
mismatch in ventilation and perfusion and subsequent hypoxemia. Clinical signs um, include dyspnea, tachypnea. Um, you may or may not hear harsh lung sounds or may or may not be a heart murmur. Diagnosis, uh, again, is pretty tricky. So uh, as we did for Sadie, a minimum database, chest x-rays. Um, in people, a CT angiogram is done pretty quickly so they can diagnose these sooner. Um, arterial blood gas would show some signs of hypoxemia, maybe a low PaO2. To find out if there's a hypercoagulable state, you could do like D-dimers. That's going to take a couple days to get back. Uh, thromboelastography is a newer technology that uh, they're using a lot in human hospitals and veterinary teaching hospitals. Um, but again, you know, if you don't have access to that, it's not very helpful for you. Uh, they can do ventilation perfusion scans. Uh, they do those in people quite commonly. And if you do an echocardiogram, sometimes you can see changes associated um, with embolism formation. And this is just a CT picture of another filling defect. So the treatment is supportive care, oxygen. Typically uh, with PTEs, they get markedly better in oxygen without many other therapies. So that can be something that if you're not sure what's going on, but they're better in oxygen, you've ruled out everything else, PTEs probably most likely. Um, we typically treat with anticoagulants. Um, some people use both heparin and clopidogrel. Um, there's different debates on which of those is better. Um, clopidogrel is probably more readily available than heparin, um, but they do work differently to kind of prevent further clot formation. They're not going to do anything about the clot that's already there. Uh, that's just going to have to get better with time for veterinary patients. Um, if you were human, they would do like a thrombo, um, thromboembolism removal, things like that, thrombolysis, which we're not really there yet. So mostly it's time and supportive care, and then these anticoagulants are to prevent further thrombus formation. IV fluids are helpful just to maintain perfusion to other parts of the lungs, and bronchodilators can also be helpful just to open up the airways. Case 11 is Baxter. He's a 13-year-old male neutered domestic short hair. Um, who presents for acute onset vocalizing, tachypnea, open mouth breathing, he's got dilated pupils, and he's rolling around. He's a pretty thin cat with a body condition score of 3 out of 9. His temperature is 103. His heart rate is 260. His respiratory rate is 100. He's got normal lung sounds, and he's got an unkempt hair coat. But Baxter is, presents a, a thyroid crisis or a thyroid storm, a hyperthyroid crisis. So that is an example of a resp non-respiratory look-alike and can be very obviously distressing to see a cat like that. You place them in oxygen, they flail around, chest x-rays are normal, they may or may not have a murmur because they probably also have some sort of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, but this is where your blood work, will blood work will come in handy if you do a T4 and it's like 14 or something. Um, so very common non-respiratory look-alike that can present as if it's in respiratory distress. So the treatment, um, typically methimazole, a beta blockers, supportive care, and they usually calm down within a couple of hours. Last case I have for you is Marley. It's a four-year-old male intact German short-haired pointer um, who presents acutely non-ambulatory. Um, and then when, she, when he arrives to the clinic, he can't move much more than his eyelids, so he's laterally recumbent. Um, and then someone notices that his gums are purple, even though he's not in respiratory distress. He's just kind of lying there. His pulse ox is 82%. Um, you're able to get an arterial blood gas, and his PaCO2 is 73 and his PaO2 is 59. Because of that very high CO2, um, you sedate him and uh, intubate him with an endotracheal tube and you're manually breathing for him. Uh, while you're doing that, you get some more information. His chest x-rays are normal, um, but he's still making no effort to breathe on his own, even off sedation. Uh, so Marley has coonhound paralysis, uh, which is actually a lower motor neuron or a neuromuscular disease, so it's not, um, you know, it's not a disease within the airway itself, but the disease can affect the respiratory muscles. Um, so basically, he's paralyzed, so he can't, his chest wall can't move to uh, bring air in and out of his lungs.
Um, so these patients typically will require mechanical ventilation um, until the respiratory muscle function is regained, which sometimes can take two or three weeks. Um, but they usually can make a recovery and do quite well. But this is another kind of non-respiratory, um, but with the purple gums, the low pulse ox um, can kind of be misleading. So just to summarize, um, initially all dystonic patients uh, are going to need oxygen and stabilization. Um, so the medications and other interventions like thoracocentesis or tracheostomy that you might need to make can be made after your physical exam, um, taking a good history, and then just kind of knowing what diseases are common in the pet that you're presented with. Um, also, just remember not to stress the patient to obtain diagnostics and just be calm but ready to intervene. So I've put pictures of endotracheal tubes there for a reason. If you're ever in doubt, just intubate them. It will be fine. Does anyone have any questions? If you all have respiratory cases and you're not sure, you can always call us. We're happy to help. I personally love these things. I don't know a lot of other ER doctors do, but... Um, or if you have weird x-rays or anything, you can send them to our email or call us. We're happy to help. Bye. Bye.